Well, welcome into this special edition of Terp Talk. And for this uh, edition, we bring in, in my opinion, uh, a crew. We got Tony Wheeler from 24-7, who constantly screams and writes throughout the entire game. We got Mr. Non-Rev from Terp Talk, that's Todd Carton, specializes in lacrosse and all the non-rev sports from Maryland. Mason Viner, uh, Mason, along with Wayne and myself, basically run Terp Talk and terptalk.com. And then we got the big guy, number one, Brett Makar, who helped. And he said to me yesterday, he felt responsible when he left that this defense turns out to be good. And Brett, you got to be happy and proud after that game against UVA. Yeah, yeah, it feels good. Uh, last few days, been able to spend a good amount of time with John Geppert, who uh, left Maryland with me last year as well. And, uh, you know, anytime you, you leave a program, especially um, one like Maryland, you hope that, you know, you left a positive impact on, you know, the guys that you played with. And uh, you do feel responsible and, and hope that, you know, the tradition, the legacy, and, um, the impact that you did leave uh, carries on. And this group definitely uh, makes me feel good knowing how hard they play and how connected they are. And um, they really, really have represented Maryland um, and the standard that Maryland lacrosse, especially defense, uh, has been for, for long before I got there. So, uh, so Brett, you were, you were the first defender ever to get the number one jersey. You wore it well. You were proud. You re represented it well. Tell us what you think about Ajax's year this year. Yeah, he's uh, he's been phenomenal. I mean, uh, obviously, I knew uh, very early on when I met Ajax, uh, you know, during his recruiting process, and obviously being his teammate at Maryland, that uh, he was a special type of guy. Uh, and and now, kind of seeing him blossom into the player that he is today is is super exciting and, and very special. And couldn't be happier for him. Um, you know, just knowing how great of a guy he is and. Uh, I think he was he was perfect for this type of situation, just someone that's super comfortable in himself and, uh, you know, has his own way of going about things. So I knew that he was going to do it in an authentic way, um, in a way that he would make his own mark and his own legacy, which which he's done and, and gone totally beyond what I think anyone, um, you know, thought was possible for a defender. So he's he's been phenomenal, and I'm super excited and happy for him. Mason Viner uh, uh, played goalie in high school. <clears throat> And uh, is an assistant coach at uh, uh, what school is it? Walt Women? Wooten. Yeah, Walt, Wooten. what's it? Thomas Wooten. All right, whatever. Well, I don't know the area, but uh, Mason, and you're also good friends with uh, Logan McNanny. Tell, tell us about his up and down and his growth into these playoffs, and how all of a sudden it's like the old Logan McNanny. Yeah, I think Brett's the best to tell us about what Logan can do in his production and just the change that he's gotten as he's gotten more healthy throughout the year Brett I mean what have you seen from Logan obviously you saw him attacking the ground balls there on Saturday it looked like the the guy before the injury and the way that he just takes on these playoff games yeah uh you know I think to some of Logan he's a, he's a gamer um you know he's uh he's the type of guy that never gets too high never gets too low and that's the type of personality you want in the cage um and when the moments are, are brightest I think for a lot of people maybe uh, they wouldn't feel super comfortable in those situations, but for Logan, he just makes it look so natural. Um, so anytime the stakes are higher, uh, that's when you get the best out of him. So I think it, you know, it being the last weekend of the year, I expect nothing less than for him to be active, making those types of plays. And then obviously seeing a lot of great shots, you know, that in part to the fantastic defense that's being played, but also him just uh, all the preparation he does with coach Tills, just seeing he's, it. He's had it up and down year though. And God knows I love him to death. I mean, he's a great <laughs> kid, but he has, a, I mean, 14 goals he gave up against Notre Dame in the first game, and uh, he only had nine saves. Those are not uh, Logan McNanny numbers. But, Mason, how good has he been the last two weeks? I mean, you've been down on the field watching him uh, eyeball to eyeball. I mean, he's been special these past few weeks. Yeah, no doubt about that, Bruce. I mean, you're looking at a guy, and and Todd and I were going back and forth in the car on the way up saying if playoff Logan and playoff Luke show up, there's no way that Maryland's going to lose this weekend. And, and, I mean, those two, they just deliver for this team time, time and again throughout their careers, but especially, you know, when they, they needed it. They need those two to dominate the game, and and they've definitely delivered that here in the past couple of weeks. We're going to stay on the defense for a minute. Tony, uh, you're the matchup guy, all right? You, you know, 
go over what they did in the first game and what you predict could happen. I'd like to hear what Brett thinks about that. And certainly the growth of Colin Bur- Burles, he's been just special with AJ Larkin and Schaller. I mean, all of a sudden we're not petrified that maycar has gone and Ajax is going next year. We ain't happy about it, but this team will move on. Right, Tony? Yeah. And against, against Princeton, and, and this is a little bit of a blueprint that, that I know, that I know Brett was, was part of um, with Ajax taking the, the, the disruptor, the, the, the guy that's going to run around a ton. Um, so against Princeton, you know, it made a lot of sense that you get, that you get uh, Ajax playing, playing Mackesy. Everyone thought that, that he was going to take uh, Brennan O'Neill. If Brett Makar had been on the field, Brett would have been taking Brennan O'Neill. Um, but he wasn't. But, but he wasn't. He wasn't. Yeah. And and this is a question I have for Brett. You know, is 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 Coach Bernhard? It seems like what he likes to do is is to try to take out the distributor. So I thought Zapatello immediately was going to take Zawada, or if they were going to invert uh, Macadori, right? Mm-hmm. Just try and get those speed guys, try and erase them, and then take your chances. Is that something that that, that Coach Bernhard likes to? Does he does he talk about that? Yeah, um, I think just a staple of the entire defense and honestly the program, it's, um, you know, kind of like a super selfless mindset. You know, I think maybe at, you know, other places or certain guys would have certain feelings about, you know, being a number one cover guy of sorts and then, you know, maybe not getting the matchup that they felt felt they deserved or whatever it may be. But um, I think what is a differentiator at Maryland is it's that super selfless mindset. I mean, and what Jesse does super well is he'll puts guys in spots to, um, you know, let, allow their skills and their traits and the certain things that they do well in their game to kind of stand out and be advantageous to the rest of the group. Um, you know, and just because, you know, one matchup favors maybe another guy's skill set one way or the other, uh, you know, I think that's kind of how Jesse has uh, decided to go about things in the past. And, I mean, obviously the results you can't argue with, so – you know, the other, uh, yeah, Tony, the other thing I was going to say too, Bruce, you asked about Colin Burles, and again, you know, Brett, you played with him. Watching his development from when he was playing with you and Ajax, he was that off-ball guy, right? Phenomenal off-ball yeah. player. Now you're seeing him get a little more comfortable on ball. But I'm wondering, uh, Bruce, you had asked if I had to guess a matchup, just based on how I try to watch the game. Obviously, I think Ajax is going to take Patrick Pat Kavanaugh. I think Will Schaller might take might take Chris, yeah, uh, because you need someone inside against against Jake Taylor, and and I'm, I put my money on Colin Burles for that one. Yeah, Jake I've Taylor seen... got four goals in the first game, and Jordan Faison isn't he the football player? Got mm-hmm. three goals, so they're they're guys kind of like uh, who you don't expect to. And Devin McLean got three goals. They got 10 goals between those three guys. And Kavanaugh and the Kavanaugh brothers only got two, uh, three. Uh, Pat only had one, but he did have three assists. It's a lot of weapons on this team, isn't it, Britt? But uh, who guards Faison, Tony? Well, I don't know if he gets the poll. I mean, Brett, what do you think? I, I don't know if they're going to if they're going to give him the poll or or if they're yeah. going to give it to McLean, who just ate them up too. Yeah, I think. I, I would think going into it, phase on probably starts with the poll. I know uh, in the past we've put a shorty to Dobson and just kind of been a little bit more aware of that matchup, you know, letting the short stick kind of get him in a spot where we want him to get to, try and get a piece of him, keep him going one direction, preferably not to his left. And if you got a support, you have to. Um, so I would think, you know, just phase on being the type of athlete that he is and he has that ability to kind of get north south and, um, you know, draw slides pretty effectively. Uh, you know, maybe you put the poll on him to start, see how that goes. But uh, with what McLean's shown the last few weeks, uh, I think that's a possibility as well. But I would say probably start off with the poll on phase on, see how that, you know, first few possessions go, see if he's kind of initiating what kind of role they have for him in their offensive game plan and, and go from there. I think that's another thing that stood out is, the defensive adjustments they've kind of been able to make on the fly the last few weeks has been super impressive. So credit to them and coach Bernhardt. Todd, I'll get to you in one minute, but I want to ask Brett. 
I, I wanted to ask Brett and, and Tony one question while they're still, still on defense. And that is something that Mason and I talked a lot about again in the car coming back after the game. Can you guys talk about the growth of Maryland's short stick unit over the season? I mean, I, I think that that unit has grown tremendously and been phenomenal since we started the NCAA tournament. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, when you look at the the 22 team, you almost got spoiled at that position, right? You were, you had such a uh, high expectation after We that. can't talk about the 22 team know, because this, this team is not the 22 team. The yeah, 22 and, team got 24 goals against Johns Hopkins and they cut themselves off after three quarters. All right. Yeah, you like, <laughs> you almost have like these unfair expectations after those teams. Right. And you had some of that kind of carry over, I think in the last year, even a little bit this year. Um, but you got to realize, right. Every team's different. Every group has their strengths. Every team hits their stride at different points in the year. And uh, this group, especially their short stick unit kind of exemplifies that. Um, and they've gotten better, better every week, especially when the games have gotten more important. So uh, we got to delve into the brilliance of John Tillman for a minute. Okay because he's getting kudos from all over the lacrosse world. I mean, Rambo and his whole crew was there with the Maltz and uh, Colin Heacock, and they were just screaming his name. What's a Tom, what's a John Tillman preparation film session like? And how long does it go on for? I mean, is it like, for? is it like, like never ends? Because yeah. some, sometimes he talks and it never ends, okay? Yeah, yeah, they definitely, uh, they definitely been known to be extensive. I mean, I almost think everything he does is is so calculated and has such a reason and meaning behind it. Um, but I think now, like being on the other side and kind of reflecting on how he goes about his business and the way the programs run, um, there's such a methodolo methodology to the madness. And um, I think the biggest thing is you want to be around people that care, right? And what better you know example of that than for your head coach to know every single detail and want his guys to be prepared that you know the best they possibly could be um and I think at times it could be frustrating as a player because you're tired of watching hours and hours of the same film but uh there's a good reason for it and, and I don't think anyone prepares or watches more film than him so he definitely sets himself apart there you know, I was talking with Todd today, before, just talking about what we were going to talk about today, and I mentioned that uh, that I was shocked, and I don't follow it that close. Todd does that the Northwestern women lost to Boston College today, fourteen to thirteen. To me, it was a not a major upset, but it was a minor upset. But then Todd brought up a point, and I and I kind of correlated it to Notre Dame and Maryland. Todd, go ahead, go through the whole thing there. Yeah, well, what I what I said to Bruce earlier was that when I was covering the, the women's lacrosse team back when they were in the early 2010s in the Taylor Cummings era and so on, the one team that I hated to play early before the championship game and even in the championship game was North Carolina because North Carolina was the one team that could beat Maryland occasionally and they walked on the field. Most teams walked on the field and they, they had lost the game. Syracuse being a great example before they got on the field, they knew they were going to lose to Maryland. And it's similar. If you look at, at the BC Northwestern, they have played 14 times in the last four or five years, they're seven and seven. So BC goes out with a certain level of confidence, knowing they can play with Northwestern. So, and they had a measure of revenge because Northwestern clocked them pretty good in the national championship game last year. So I, my correlation there was Corrigan and the Cavanaugh's when they beat Maryland in overtime last year, Brett, they acted like they won the national championship. You remember, I mean, you know, Pat Cavanaugh was going nuts, jumping around and they still thought they were better than us in 22, which is laughable. Okay. But, but they knew how big that win was. And it catapulted them, I really believe, into their continuation to a title. But in their minds, Brett, did you ever lose to Notre Dame while you were at Maryland? Yeah, last year. we lost. Besides last year, besides the last yeah. game. Um, 
Yeah, my freshman year in 2019, we lost when we played them inside. We played in oh, their in their. Did I, yeah. I, I? I went nuts on Tillman for agreeing to play that game inside. There were so yeah. many sun angles and light angles in that game, and we lost it because somebody lost the ball in the lights, if I remember correctly. But right, yeah. we lost that one. But every one, t- every time we got to them in a big game, we found a way to win. All right, every time. Mm. And it wasn't to say they were easy wins. They were brutal, you know, brutal games. But uh, so Notre Dame, in their mind, they might be tremendously confident against every team they play. But they know John Tillman, and they know Maryland. And there has to be a little doubt in their heads, all right? And maybe not. Maybe they just believe they were invincible like your team did in 22. Mm-hmm. But things happen in games, you know. All of a sudden, when it was 9-5 to five against Cornell and everybody was breathing, you know, uh, breathing like there was no tomorrow, that game looked different all of a sudden. Mm-hmm. And if that happens tomorrow, and we don't know if it's going to or not, but uh, I just feel that's a factor in this. Tony, what do you think? I was going to ask Brett a question, actually, because um... – in the 22 season, we were down waiting for you guys to, to come off the field and, you know, for the interview after the, the final four game. And I mean, that game was a brutal game, right? I mean, that, that game you guys it beat the hell out of us. Okay. I mean, physically. It was, and I think the weight of expectations and, and this ride you guys were on and, and in the press conference today, you know, Kevin Corrigan didn't get a single question about Maryland. All the questions were about, whether or not they were this team of destiny and the expectations and the burden and all that. But yesterday I was down the tunnel again and that Maryland team came off and they were fired up one more game. I mean, they were, they were fired up. I don't remember you all coming off the field against Princeton with that level of kind of energy, as much as it felt like you all were like, all right, we, we got to get to the end of it. We got to finish it you know did you feel that way or is that something i'm i'm putting on you guys yeah it's actually funny um i think just that whole weekend could be so much i know and like the first time right we definitely felt more of that in 21 you know that year um we had a lot of like the covid restrictions right we played majority big 10 schedule till the ncaa tournament um, and there's just so much excitement into it. And the weekend could almost feel like so big, right? You get to that point. It feels like um, it's the biggest weekend of your life. It's the you know culmination of the entire sport, right? Playing Memorial Day weekend and um, the biggest crowd I know I've played in front of. Um, and you feel that, right? You're worried about getting your family members tickets and all, making sure everyone's taken care of. There's so much to think about outside of just playing. Um, And then when you win that one, you could get so hyped up and you're ready to just play that one last game and empty the tank. Um, And I think learning from that first experience in 21, um, we needed for 22 because we came back, we'd experienced it. We felt that adrenaline rush. We'd all played in the final four before we knew what it was going to be like, knew, you know, the expectation playing in a similar setting, same stadium, all that stuff. So 22 was business as usual. We won the first game. Great. Let's get ready for Monday. Um, so I think maybe Maryland's feeling a little bit of kind of how we felt in 21, just the excitement of it for a lot of those guys playing in their first final four, which they should be. Um, but thankfully they do have guys like Ajax and McNaney to kind of, you know, bring them back down to earth a little bit and, uh, you know, know that that last game, weird things can happen. We saw that in 21 with the way that one ended losing. Um, but then also in in 22 winning, it kind of got a little hairy there. So you never know what's going to happen on that last day. Um, but I know just with the older leadership they have. Uh, you know, they'll get back down to earth real quick and be ready to go tomorrow. Go ahead, Mason. So, Brett, uh, I'll go off of that last one. Take us through the entire weekend from a player's perspective because we're down there on the field, the game's over, and Tillman's on the phone saying, when can we get out of here? Can you just take us, walk us through the weekend from when you guys get there on Thursday all the way through through Monday? Yeah. Um, I mean, one, it's it's a phenomenal experience. Right. And I think when you play at a place like Maryland, obviously you realize the support that you have and, uh, you know, how much it means to people, uh, just the program as a whole. 
But for that weekend, you know, you really get to see all of those people that care in one place. And you see all these people come from different parts of the country to support you and your teammates. Um, and that's aside from, you know, your family, friends, people you went to high school with, played with your, you know, entire career. I um, mean, it kind of all comes into just one one setting. And it's such a special thing. Um, but yeah, travel on Thursday, right? You get there, you usually have, um, you know, check into the hotel, whatever it may be, maybe a, a light walk through some film. Uh, Friday, you get to go to the stadium, which is pretty cool experience, right? See the field and, uh, you know, it being lined out and uh, all those things you kind of dream about playing Memorial Day weekend, watching it throughout the years. Um, you know, Saturday, kind of try and come back down to, to earth, like I said, and, and really focus on the game plan and what's at hand, try not to get too excited and uh, kind of exhaust yourself uh, before the game even begins. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, my first experience was definitely a little different. My first time playing there I was really, really excited and, uh, you know, kind of felt some of that, you know, uh, after the game, right, where uh, you're so pumped up and everyone's so excited for you and you got to kind of have to see your family. But, you know, all those people, it's a, it's a party for them. It's a celebration. They're at the Final Four. Um, and I think you can kind of get lost into that a little bit. I know, I like I said, I felt that a little bit the first time um, when, you know, everyone's so excited, you know, we're playing in the championship. Um, but then in, in 22, definitely a little bit of a, you know, business as, as usual, got to keep it moving, feeling. Um, but yeah, after Saturday, you know, Sunday, big recovery day, right? Watch the film, maybe light walk through. Uh, you really got to hone in on, on the game plan because it's such a quick turnaround. Hopefully, you know, you have some experience with the team, you know, in the past and, you you know, you know some of their tendencies and what they've done. Um and, you know, I know we've done like IVs and you try and hydrate as much as, as possible, all those kinds of things. Um, and then honestly, Monday kind of feels more contained and controlled. Saturday is like a huge deal because four teams are playing. So, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, excitement and all those kinds of things. Um, and you, you have that Monday, but it feels kind of just super, super locked in and different in a way um, because there's only two teams left. So, uh you know, you play that last game and try and empty the tank, leave nothing left in store, um, you know, and hopefully you kind of leave their champion. You know, it's oh. funny. I, I'll never forget uh, Joe Cummings. You guys all know who he is. We were playing, I think, I think it was the first year, and that might have been Farrell who said it to me, but I remember Joe Cummings said to me maybe the second year, and it was a year when the, it was a 95 degrees, all right, for the first game. And when before the game, I got a chance to talk to Joe, who's a good friend. And he said to me, Bruce, he said, if we only had a week to get ready for this game, all right, mm -hmm. there was no doubt in my mind. And I think every one of us believe that if Tills had a week to prepare, it could be a different game. But this team is different. All right. And I say that by, uh, the interviews I've had with uh, Jack Chorus and Daniel Kelly and a lot of guys on the offense, this is my segue into the offense. They almost felt like when they got the bid, all right, to play Princeton or whatever, where they got, you know, they were a little worried. I wasn't because I knew the RPI game, but they were, and they had a right to be worried if the, what happened against Penn State. But I think when they got that bid, like a weight was released off of them and they said, Hey, we got a chance to redeem ourselves. And then Michael Phipps and Tillman started using 13 guys on offense and almost equally. So all of the middies and course said to me, the, all the middies came in fresher and Notre Dame does that. They run three lines. Is that right, Tony? No matter what. All right. And they're not the game that they won against us, which was greatly enhanced by those two unreleasable fouls at the end of the first half. That's not going to happen again. First of all, these refs, they didn't even call a foul on Saturday. I mean, come on. I mean, there, there were 10 fouls that could have been called. But I just think there's a new lease on life on this team. And I, that's why I was very confident against Virginia. Notre Dame's a different cat, though, okay? Brett, I'll let you start off. Talk about the way their defense will attack this new offense of ours, all right? And they haven't seen it, and it is a new offense because we got 
everybody playing different positions, you know, uh, it, it's just devised, you know, even with when Deemer class uh, reviews this one, I'm interested to hear what he has to say, but what do you see has been the improvement in this defense offense rather? Yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, all the moving pieces, right? Like you just discussed, um, just thinking about it from a defensive perspective, right? You go through your whole week and, uh, you know, whether you're doing scout or even for a championship game with, with a quick turnaround, you kind of get that scouting report, you know, that night after you kind of win the, that fi- that first semifinal game. Um, and when you got to know so many guys' tendencies, their dominant hand, you know, what they like to do as an offensive player, uh, you know, you got to really – you know, prepare in depth. And the more guys that are on that scouting report, the harder it is for a defense. So um, I, I imagine Notre Dame will, you know, obviously do as best that they can. But when there's so many guys to prepare for it, that's a lot, especially in such a quick turnaround time. Tony, your take on that. Yeah, and and Brent, it's – I think you're – after the game, I had a chance. Uh, I saw I saw Eric Molliver, and he said to me, UVA didn't ever know who was running through the box. They all the matchups, all the matchups got scrambled constantly. You'd see Kastner trying to bump up to double pull the which midfield line they were going to double pull when they weren't going to double pull the midfield line, and the the cascade effect from that is when guys don't know matchups, all the slide and recoveries get blown apart. All of a sudden, you got Dan Kelly slipping to the goal for easy dunks, right? So that that's the knock on of it. What I think is going to be interesting is, is the first matchup, uh, Sean Light, the, the freshman out of Notre Dame, their next great, you know, on-ball defender. Yeah, he's he wild. really, Yeah, and he really gave Braden Irks a trouble because he can match Braden's feet. He's still a pretty physical guy. Um, I'm, I'm expecting them to bump him when, when, if, when Braden runs through the box. I'm expecting, I'm expecting Notre Dame to, to, to bump him up. Um, and that means Kelly will get the short again. But the great thing about the infusion of speed and athleticism in the midfield is someone's still going to get a short stick. Yeah. Someone's still going to get it. And yeah. since there's not a set first line, second line, because they are rotating guys through through all of these lines for Maryland, um, I think it makes it harder for defenses, as you were saying, to like, know your personnel, know the tendencies. You know, when are we bumping up? You know, oh, now, now Irx is back at attack again. How does that scramble thing? So um, it looks like that's been really beneficial. Uh, No doubt. I can imagine uh, that has to be a headache to prepare for. Um, And I think, too, the the wealth has been spread evenly. Everyone's kind of taken their turn having a huge game. Last game you see Spano was two games ago at Syracuse. Right? Who do you identify as being a guy that is deserving of drawing a slide? Who's going to be the guy that, um, you know, is going to be initiating the offense? So many different things that go into preparing for a game and, uh, when you're kind of a little bit clueless going in, that that's definitely an advantage for the Terps. Yeah, does, especially does like. Maryland, uh, go ahead. I was just going to say, does 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 Maryland have an advantage defensively like that because they've seen this sort of three three midfield lines from Notre Dame? They played it. They've seen it all year. Notre Dame probably. I don't even know how much they could have prepared for this because they don't. They don't know whether they're playing Maryland or Virginia. So they're looking at Maryland for the first time. So does that convey some advantage to Maryland in for, for because Maryland has made this change? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, regardless, uh, you know, Notre Dame obviously they run those three midi lines, but I think schematically and personnel wise, they're the same team that they saw in March, right? But Maryland, it almost seems like they're an entirely different team. Obviously they are personnel wise with the way they've mixed and matched, but um, also just the way they're playing, right. The pace that they're playing at, um, you know, I think you see a lot of differences, not only just the guys they're rolling out there, but the style that they're playing. Um, Like I said, the pace they're playing at, it it almost feels like they're an entirely different team, even though it may be the same guys or some of the same guys that were playing in that first matchup. uh, It it feels like a a totally uh, new team. You know, I wonder who uh, started those rumors about Dante Trader was going to show up. Tony, I mean, I must have heard it 20 times, you know. He's definitely but, itching. I, I don't think a game goes by without me and him texting for the entirety of it. He, uh, he, uh, yeah, I mean, he, he loves the guys. You talk about um, a top-level competitor. 
and, and Dante checks all the boxes. I, you know, I was sad to see that he uh, wasn't coming back for another year, but uh, I know that all the guys in the locker room now with with the lacrosse program, you know, love that guy and uh, the feelings mutual. He's uh, he's one of one in a lot of ways. All right, we'll go through everybody in about one minute. Tell me how you think this game is going to go, how it's going to start. And uh, I'll, get, I'll start off here, all right? I really believe that uh, Maryland comes out of the box strong. They just have been doing it recently. And I know Will Lynch, you know, he beat the guy from Denver to death and whatever. But the last time, uh, the last numbers against Maryland, 13 and 13 against uh, Luke Weirman. But let me tell you something. There's a reason Luke Weirman was the only faceoff guy taken to the PLL draft. Because I don't care who's first team, and they talked about Naso from Duke being first team. We saw what happened there. Everybody says they're going to beat Luke Weirman, but nobody does. All right? The guy from Michigan, they're pretty damn good, though. I won't say that much. Okay? But I believe Luke, all right, I don't know if he'll get clean wins like he did. His wins against Virginia were unbelievable. They weren't even contested almost. And 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 uh, Lars had no answer for him, all right, the whole game. He didn't know what to do. I don't think that'll happen this game. I think, you know, you have more talent on, on Notre Dame. It's a tougher team. And uh, I, I think Maryland gets off to a good start, and but they don't run away with this one, all right, because that powerhouse offense from Notre Dame – uh, makes this game close all the way. And uh, I just got that feeling. And it could go the other way. There's no quit in Maryland. They're not intimidated. They are on what we call house money. All right. They're in a position that that one guy here, and probably you too, Brett, after that Hopkins game and Penn State game, thought we'd be sitting here having this show. All right. I didn't even think there was a chance. So I'll go down the line here, Todd. How do you think the early part of the game starts off? Um, I, I think I think both teams are probably going to – you're going to see a, a, some real feeling out from both teams. Um, I do think that Weirman starts off, probably starts off hot uh, just because, as, as Mason mentioned before, I keep talking about playoff Luke and playoff Logan and, and then playoff Tills. So – uh, and and Luke really has a lot of belief in the guys that he works with uh, in practice every week. So they start off hot. I just get the feeling, Bruce, as, as potent an offense as Notre Dame has, I think first team to 10 probably wins this game. As the, the old Maryland theory. Tony, your take. I've been saying uh, since since Duke, essentially, like we're in Ted Lasso territory here on, on Believe, right? And you can tell these these guys believe. Um, it's this is the fourth time Lynch and Weirman have played. It's hard to know when they played in March. Lynch went went twelve of eighteen. The other two times he's played Weirman, he went thirteen of thirty, and he went four of thirteen. So w- which one's the outlier? You know, it's hard to tell. I do think that Weirman is going to. I do think Luke's going to get overall the better play if he can get anywhere near 60 percent i'm just not sure notre dame's going to have enough enough opportunities i think that probably the game plan for maryland is to try and turn this into a rock fight i think it's going to start out pretty similarly to what happened with uva where you know one of the one of the kavanaugh brothers is going to want to make some kind of spectacular play to see if they can get out fast notre dame's got a bit of a history of starting slow though um so i I could see it playing out sort of like the beginning of that Denver Notre Dame game on, on Saturday. Um, the one thing that Maryland has is Luke Weirman. I think Notre Dame wants to go on these three or four goal runs so they can just glide the rest of the way in. I don't think Weirman lets them do that. I agree. I think it's going to be first team to 10. I could easily see sort of this 10, nine kind of game. And it's hard to not believe in this team. Mason. Well, Tony stole mine. I was going right for the belief line, but Tony took it. So I'll come up with something different. <laughs> um, Tony's a known thief, you know. Yeah. I Monday is different. It always is. But the one thing that I'll point out as a difference is you 
all know John Tillman has had Notre Dame film lined up on that iPad since the day that Maryland lost to them. Uh, you know, 80, I think it's like 89 days ago or some crazy number than that, not quite 89, but uh, I think that Maryland's preparation is just superior in these moments. The ability to cut the film up during the game, analyze what's going on. The bench is so into the game and, and constantly correcting and changing things throughout uh, the day. And look, we might see one of the best Monday games that, that we've seen in years with two teams that run so many guys out of the box, so much talent on the field on both ends. But I ultimately think it comes down to something we talked about earlier, which is the short stick defensive midfield. The way Nick Red right now, especially, is playing, fighting over the picks, taking contact over uh, checks, the way these guys are playing. I see the same thing. It's going to be a race to 10 or 11. And I just, right now, I'm drinking the Kool-Aid, Tony. I'm believing. I don't see there's a way that Terps aren't coming up away with that trophy. Brett? Yeah. Um, I think it's uh, it's going to be an interesting start. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Maryland was super excited right out of the gate and, um, you know, maybe needs to come back down uh, a little bit. So I think maybe Notre Dame gets out to an early first quarter lead, you know, three nothing or three one after the end of the first, um, you know, Terps need to keep it within one or two going into the second half. Um, but I know for a fact, you hear all these, these stats and statistics about the Notre Dame third quarter runs they go on. I know that's going to be the first thing on the top of the scouting report, third quarter, third quarter, third quarter, you know, prevent those runs. Um, and I think Maryland's going to do a really good job of that, keeping those third quarter runs at bay. Um, but I, I could see a, you know, 10, 9, 11, 10 final, like you guys are saying, but um, I think Maryland as the game goes on, is just going to get better shake over, shake off that kind of excitement that could kind of, um, you know, be negative in a sense to start settle into the game and then deliver their best punches towards the end. Well, the ride from Notre Dame hurt Maryland big time in the first game, Maryland, was only 75% successful in, in the clears. <clears throat> and I noticed that uh, Tillman came out with the ride, which is like unheard of, but uh, nothing surprised me from him. And one thing we know, teams that like to press in basketball hate to be pressed. And I can tell you that as a guard who was uh, on a team that full court pressed the whole time. And when I got pressed, I like was like, my head was spinning. I was so upset. Okay, so... Uh, we never know what Tills is going to do. All right, let's go down. Final question. Real fast, can, real, go real ahead. fast for, for Brett, and just because this is something we haven't discussed it, and that is, I just really want to know from your perspective, playing on grass and in a game where it could be a wet field, even though they've moved the game up to hopefully avoid the rain. You know, I'm seeing showers in Philadelphia like overnight all morning, and there's some breaks. How, how does that impact the game? Because you're playing most of your season on turf and now you're playing on grass and then, and then it's going to be wet grass. Equalizer. Yeah. That's what it is. It's an equalizer. That's what I believe. Go ahead, Brett. No, I mean, that's another thing that Tills does really well. I know those guys all week, they've been practicing on grass on, the, they got Sastro, his permission to practice on the practice soccer fields and they were on <laughs> there all week, ripping it up. I know that for a fact. Um, it's also tough, the Final Four field, because you don't realize not only are there two games on Saturday, you have the Division Two, II, Division Three championships on Sunday. So by the time you get to Monday, the field, as best as they can, try and keep it intact. It's, it's, it's you know, not great shape. It's not in pristine condition like you remember it on Saturday. Um, and then, you know, bring the rain into play. Uh, I, I hope the boys practice, pack the screw and cleats because it's going to be uh, going to be a little messy, but. Uh, that's another well, thing. I'm going to tell you one thing. If it rains, Maryland played almost every game in the rain this year at home. I mean, the, we the weather was horrendous, you know. Terps love the rain. <laughs> but, you know, Maryland, we're turtles, that's why. Yeah, Maryland but, didn't play on grass until, you know, in, until the final. I think their first game on grass this year was the Final Four, right? Yeah. Um, whereas can you be, East, Tony, can you be a better team on grass than Terps? Well, in the ACC, though, you know, even though Notre Dame plays at Arlotta there with on turf, they're playing at they're playing at Clockner, they're playing at Coskin, and they're playing down at UNC. So they've definitely played, as Brett is saying, on some pretty torn up fields. They've got a lot more experience on torn up fields. I think it, the rain probably slows things down a little. Yeah, for sure. And the bounce will probably be different shooting wise. So those guys will, you know, 
figure that out in warm ups and then during the game. It's, it's all things that, that come into play that people really don't think about. But uh, well, people know I, what we think, so I'm not going to ask for any scores. I don't want any bulletin board material going around in case somebody happens to look at this. But uh, Brett Makar, gonna... Brett Makar says, <laughs> "Yeah, right. right. <laughs> look, we all know Notre Dame is a great team. Yeah, we have to look at it from that viewpoint. They've beaten everybody. They've run away with games. They ran away from Denver. They, I mean, they lost to Georgetown, and that's probably the best thing that happened to them because I think it was a wake up call that early in the year, and they took it out on every team they played, including the Terps." I mean, they've been uh, fantastic. And I did have a, a brief 10-second interlude with Coach Corrigan because I happened to know him. And I said, I said, Kevin, congrats. I said, I hope we get a shot, a shot at you on, uh, on Monday. He says, I wouldn't be surprised. You know what I mean? So, you know, he's going to say that no matter what. But uh, we're the Terps and we're Maryland, all right? And we have an air about us and – we are loose. That much I'll tell you, okay? And there ain't going to be big tears if we lose, all right? We know how greatly this team achieved. But uh, when it comes down to it, I like John Tillman. I like decisions he'll make. I like uh, things like that. But I think Brett said it the best. We just have to stay within range. We have to stay within range. So when we get to the fourth quarter everybody's thinking all right everybody's thoughts on and we know how great pat cavanaugh is there's no denial and his brother chris is just as good in my opinion and uh, jake taylor has been insane and these guys they know how to put points on the board but we, we're going to see you on monday so with that unless anybody else any has any more comments i think that does it but uh brett the best thing about I felt good for you is beating Virginia and you got Connor Schellenberger coming to the New York Atlas along with Cormier. That's yeah. got to be, you're going to be the king of the trash talk, my friend. All right. It's not bad. I've already been letting Xander and, and Doc Aiken hear it a little bit. So those, uh, the rest of the guys will be up here tomorrow. So your um, team so. is kind of like the Virginia team then. Yeah. Yeah. We uh, picked up uh, a few more, a few more calves over the last few weeks, but, um, you know, they, they've all been great and looking forward to getting them up here, but they'll definitely hear it from me. Uh, yeah, talk, talk about Mike Pressler for just a minute. And uh, he's got a, supposed to be a great field coach. I mean, I know you don't have that much interaction like you do with Tillman, but what's your impressions of him? Yeah, no, uh, phenomenal. I mean, uh, when someone's been around for the game that long, have so much experience around it. Um uh, and you, I think what's really neat is you get the everyone has their own perspective and their own way of doing things, and uh, it's been phenomenal to, to be around someone like that for sure. All right, guys, I'm gonna promise you, I'm gonna do my best. I can't guarantee it, but if we win this game, all right, I'll try and get the same group with Tillman, all right. And if I can't get him, I'll get Luke or I'll get Logan or I'll get Daniel Kelly, I'll get somebody, all right, and uh, we'll do this on Monday, on Tuesday, rather. Uh, but hey, I thank you all for coming on. It was a lot of fun. And Brett, best of luck this season in the uh, PLL. As uh, you know, we got to get you to the whip snake somehow. I just it just doesn't seem right. You're not on that team. All right. Yeah. No. Well, uh, those guys are great, and uh, you know, fortunate to to be where I'm at right now. Hey, but, do you draw Rambo when you play the whip snakes? I, I hope so. This summer. Uh, last summer, I didn't have him as a matchup for for the whole game, but. Uh, fingers crossed I uh, I get that this summer. That would be interesting. All right. <laughs> I, I, you know, Matt's something special. He's great. Guys, thanks a lot. Hey, Mason, I just thought we didn't really get to talk too much about uh, Notre Dame's great goalie, Liam Entman, and you're the goalie expert here. So give us uh, your take on him and how great he's been. Yeah, Bruce, I think you have a, a, a true uh, one-of-a-kind player in Liam Entman. A Tourton finalist, obviously one of the best, if not the, I think you can call him the best. Uh, it comes down to May where we've got a great one in between the pipes on, on the Terps end. But talking about a guy who plays, you know, it's a unique stance, more of an upright kind of player, gets down to the ball really well, attacks it. Very, very aggressive, both in the goal and out of the goal in the ground ball game. And 
Look, every time you think he's going to have a bad game, halfway through that Denver game, he's not having his best game. He comes back, makes a couple huge plays for his team, and and puts him there. But really, really great, you know, stance, footwork, goalie Smith guy, um, plays the shot level technique perfectly, meaning like you know he's reading the stick of the shooter and he's dropping down and and putting himself in the best position to make the saves and uh, just one of the best that we've seen in in recent lacrosse history, Bruce. Yeah, you know, it's funny, if you look real close in the Maryland game earlier this year, he was the difference. He had 13 saves, only allowed nine goals, and, uh, uh, you know, Logan had nine and, you know, gave up 14. It was kind of like reverse. So you're right, that's crucial. And uh, Entenmann, you know, first goalie taken in the draft and uh, will be a starter right away in the PLL. All right, Mace, uh, thanks for wrapping that up for us. And uh, again, we'll get it up on YouTube as fast as we can.